If you've been on my channel for very long, it's obvious that I like video games. I mostly just upload highlights from multiplayer games with friends, but on the occasion I'll sit down and talk about a game in depth like this. That's because video games are arguably the best medium for storytelling out there. As opposed to movies, books, or TV, video games allow the audience to directly interact with the story. Whether that's just following where the game wants you to go in an uncharted style linear path, or making life or death decisions on the fly in choice based games like Mass Effect, the person playing is more involved in the story as a general rule than someone sitting and watching a screen. That's what's great about the medium of video games, and it's what has kept me involved in the hobby since I was a kid. There was a time, however, where I almost fell out of gaming. From roughly 2007 to 2009, I was slowly starting to become more and more disenchanted with games after getting hooked a few years prior with the Game Boy. This is largely because the novelty of playing through a story in a movie tie-in game had lost its luster. Chicken Little for the PS2, WALL-E for the Wii, and even the admittedly fantastic Transformers DS games just weren't doing it for me anymore. At the time, I couldn't put my finger on it, but what I was craving were new original stories that could keep me engaged without third-party IP to prop up the sometimes lackluster gameplay. In the summer of 2008, I got my first taste of what video games could really do when they set out to tell their own stories, without having to rely on recently released movies to sell copies. This was drawn to life for the Nintendo DS, published by THQ and developed by Fifth Cell. I picked it up on a whim with zero expectations outside of knowing that I could create my own hero since that's what the box advertised. I was not prepared for the charming characters, good writing, and insanely catchy music that was packed into the little tiny DS cartridge. While the gameplay wasn't revolutionary looking back, Drawn to Life is a perfect introduction to kids for what video games can do and how to properly tell a story. It helps develop their problem-solving skills with the puzzles and platforming and keeps them engaged with the well-told story that they have to read while they create tools to help them navigate the world. The ending of the first game is the first time I can recall ever crying at a piece of media, but not because it was sad, but because it ended on a happy note after so many trials and tribulations our characters had to go through. In 2009, a sequel was released, The Next Chapter. Instead of a simple cash grab, the next chapter further developed the world of Drawn to Life than an emotionally harrowing ending that your typical 5th grader was not prepared for. In a plot twist seeded throughout the two games, the world of Drawn to Life existed inside the coma dream of a boy who had been in a car crash, and that shadowy villain you had to defeat was only trying to save his world from being destroyed when the boy woke up. The lines of right and wrong were blurred, tragedy and loss now emanated from every decision you had made during the past two games, and the colorful and cheery kids games suddenly held lots of meaning and depth to them. While Spongebob spin-off and Wii title were also released in the series, we don't talk about those, so after just two games, the Drawn to Life series came to a close. For 11 years, that is. Oh my god! Okay, it's happening! Everybody stay calm! What's the procedure, everyone? Calm. In a surprising announcement, new publisher 505 Games unveiled that Drawn to Life 2 Realms would be making its way to Switch, PC, and mobile phones in December of 2020. Developing the game would be Digital Continue, a team made up of many of the creatives from Fifth Cell that originally created the games of THQ. So, with the band back together, it's time to see how the story continues on after the seeming end of the Raposa world at the end of the next chapter. I'm going to be as brief and as vague as possible since story plays such a heavy part in these games. Instead of the Raposa world ending when Mike woke up from his coma, a mysterious force allowed their world to be created anew and for everyone to live on. However, when this happened, darkness jumped into the human realm and so the creative hero must now save not one, but two realms. You get it? With a new threat approaching, the Raposo once again call for the creator, you, the player, to draw them a hero. Considering the timing of when I played the original games and the hero I drew back then, I couldn't break from tradition this time around either. So, in a game series I applaud for being a great original franchise, I can't help but throw a little third-party nostalgia into this game as well. So yes, I did spend the entirety of the original two games in this one as Perry the Platypus from Phineas and Ferb. But that's part of what's great about the series, is that your imagination is the only limit to your creativity. Set several years after the next chapter, Two Realms sees the shadow Aldark having been hard at work to corrupt the human town of Bellevue, turning the townsfolk against one another. Who Aldark is and how exactly the Raposa world still exists are questions that aren't exactly answered and seem like they're being saved for a sequel, which I'll talk about more in my conclusion. Overall, the story that is presented is fine, but doesn't quite live up to the original two games. I'll applaud Digital Continue for trying again to tackle tough subjects in a kid's game, though. Like the original two games, the story at no point talks down to kids or overexplains itself for those in the back, presenting the loss of parents and split families with a sense of maturity. It treats kids with respect and has the confidence that they can understand what's going on. While the themes and tackled subjects aren't handled perfectly, I still give the devs credit for trying to put an easy to understand message into their games to continue that aspect of the franchise, something that is arguably the heart of the franchise. The art style perfectly mimics the original style of the DS games, which were in turn mimicking the style of games for the NES era. While many of the characters utilize new HD sprites, it's clear that the artists on the game wanted to stay as true to the original games as possible. They do this to such an extent that, that there are in fact several reused sprites from the original games in the form of various creatures found in Rapoville. 
The original composer from the first two games returns to once again create a series of frustratingly catchy musical tracks that you'll be humming to yourself after playing on top of returning themes associated with the well-known characters. While the new music doesn't have the nostalgic feel of the compressed DS soundtracks, each track is great and perfectly embodies the world of Drawn to Life. Also, if you buy the game on Steam, you can get the soundtrack to come with it or separately, so that's fun. Familiar locales from both previous games can be found as well as the new human town of Bellevue. Your hero can walk around and explore both worlds at will, but this brings up the biggest change to the franchise in this game. As opposed to the original games, which were action slash adventure platformers, Two Realms is strictly a puzzle platformer. Yes, there are enemies to defeat, but completing puzzles to make it to the end of the stage is the primary gameplay loop this time around. While enemies do have to occasionally be defeated, your hero only has a basic spin attack and no additional weapons. So no acorn launcher, no sword, no ability to turn into a spider. I'm mixed on this, as I love the different upgrades and weapons you'd receive with every new world in the original games. Also in the context of this game, all the levels take place inside the minds of the people you meet, with enemies being metaphorical obstacles as opposed to real ones in the world. That does make the game feel much smaller in its scope as compared to the original two games. Rappoville and Bellevue feel much smaller knowing you don't go out and explore the forest or a big city like before. That being said, that's more of a nitpick because the gameplay is really fun. The overall objective of every stage is to reach the door at the end, but how you go about that varies from level to level. Sometimes it's simple to run to the end, and other times you have to place objects in certain places in order to use them to get across gaps. As the game goes on, more challenges are thrown your way, such as needing to escort an NPC across the stage or timing your movements of the enemies as they walk over buttons, allowing you to progress through doors. There are some levels that can be tricky to figure out, but in my experience, the game never becomes frustratingly difficult since each stage has an aha moment where you figure out how to make it to the end. Timing is everything, though. Knowing how to make it to the end of the stage isn't necessarily the same as actually being able to make it there. Various new enemies and obstacles will pop up as the game goes on, and it's up for you to figure out how they work. Part of me doesn't like that since modern games have tutorials for every new little thing that pops up, but part of me loves it because the developers trust you to figure out how everything works and don't feel like they need to hold your hand. It's almost refreshingly old school game design to go with their pixel graphics. All of this does mean lots of trial and error, however. Sometimes you have to purposely throw yourself off a ledge in order to figure out something, but since the game lacks the action-adventure element for the previous games, there aren't a limited amount of lives like before, which means the game is actually far less punishing than previous puzzle levels could have been. While there was the occasional level that I was happy to have finally passed, looking back, each one gave me a sense of satisfaction since I managed to figure out how to beat it. And judging by the results I've seen on the Drawn to Life Discord server, there's multiple ways to beat a level, with your imagination once again being key to the game. In terms of performance, when levels get a little busy, there is an occasional frame rate drop on both Switch and PC. Since timing is so key, this can lead to problems with failing levels, but this only happened to me two or three times. I've also been fortunate not to encounter many glitches. Sprites will sometimes get caught up in each other, but that's nothing a restart of the level won't fix. I've seen others report some pretty bad bugs online, but the devs are working on squashing them as of the writing of this review. Oddly enough, also at the time of this writing, the Switch's touchscreen can't be used for drawing, but that will be added so I've been told, so I won't hold that against the game. While the gameplay overall is great, the presentation of these elements at times can be a bit wonky, sparse technical issues aside. The hero can accept missions from the Raposa and human villagers that live in their respective towns, but what you find in their heads doesn't always line up with what you'd expect, as it seems like these challenges to a degree are randomly generated. So a human ice cream shop owner can have images of the lava stream section of the Raposa world in his head. Of course, the real question is, is this a presentation oversight or a hint towards something more? No, I think it's a weird oversight. And since all the stages are inside the mind, when actual shadow creatures do show up on occasion, there's not a satisfying beatdown moment where the hero is triumphant. There's also not a final boss level, just a final puzzle stage. While it may be a bit unfair to judge this game on what it didn't do, fans of previous games will be led into a bit of a bait and switch. So while there are a couple odd presentation issues here and there, I don't think they're that distracting, unless of course you're an old fan. And that's sort of my biggest problem with the game. As an old fan of the original games, I can't help but compare it to previous adventures and ask why this or that isn't in the game or why this was changed. But it's clear that the team at Digital Continue want the franchise to potentially find new life. That's why the game leaves so many questions unanswered in the plot, because they want to make more games. The size and scope of this game leads me to believe that they're testing the waters to see if the series can have legs in 2020 and beyond. In order to do this, they have to make a smaller game focusing on just one element of the previous games. In this case, the puzzles would make for the most interesting gameplay, and having played through it, I agree. While it wasn't the same and on my first run through I was questioning the changes, enough of it was the same and the stuff that was new was fun enough that I didn't care. 
Now that a lot of the heavy lifting has been done with new sprites and the hub worlds created, a potential sequel with a bigger budget could maybe open things up a little bit more and be a nice mix of new and old. And speaking of the old, the devs have discussed the idea of remaking the old games to be compatible for modern platforms, which is something I'd be all for. A lot of this rests on two realms selling enough to warrant a sequel or remix to the original games, so what's the best deal on this game? Well, the game is listed for an asking price of just $10, only being available digitally through the Nintendo eShop, Steam, and your choice of mobile phone app markets. I honestly think the game is underpriced. I could easily and gladly buy this game for $15 or $20, as even with the issues discussed, the game at its core is fun and a pretty decent length, being a good 10 hours or so. I don't know, to me a $10 asking price is for an experience 4 hours or less, so at its current price, the game is a steal. So much so, I bought it twice! Not only did I buy this game on PC and Switch, I also bought a Switch Lite since I didn't own one prior to the game coming out. I think the Switch version is probably the best place to play it since it does help replicate the nostalgic feelings of playing the originals, but the PC port isn't bad either, and I don't play PC games at all. So while I may be mixed on a few things, the game that we do get is more than worth the price of entry. If you haven't played the previous tiles and want a fun puzzle game to play, then maybe watch a Let's Play on YouTube of the originals before jumping in to understand what's going on. And to old fans of these games, if you've maybe been a little turned off by some of the changes you've heard about, I urge you to give it a chance. The team at Digital Continue had an interesting balancing point of winning over old and new fans alike, and for all the hurdles they probably had to jump through, I think they did a good job. I can only hope and pray that there's enough of an audience out there to let this series continue. Remakes of the originals, sequels, just give me whatever you got, Digital Continue. I know you guys care, and that's all that matters to me. So, for anyone out there that's vaguely interested in this game, please, please, please give it a shot. A mere $10 to help secure the future of a beloved franchise isn't that much to ask.